As, for instance, do we depart from ecclesiastical communion with Rome because she is corrupt and unsound in doctrine? The papists can tell us the generality of the Jewish doctors and teachers were the most degenerate and corrupt in their doctrine. They made the command of God of none effect by their traditions. They taught for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verses 6 and 9. Do the Protestant churches allege that they depart from communion with Rome because she is tyrannical in government? The papists can tell us, Jerusalem killed the prophets and stoned them that were sent under her. If the Protestants shall yet further allege the church of Rome imposes sinful and unwarrantable terms of communion, the papists may reply, the Jewish Sanhedrin did not impose the most sinful and wicked term of communion when they enacted that if any man did confess Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue, i.e. excommunicated, John 9 verse 22. And I humbly judge that neither Mr. Curry nor Mr. Lawson can answer the reasonings of the papists according to the above way and manner in which Mr. Lawson has laid the argument. And therefore, in order to answer effectually the above subterfuges of the papists, the peculiar state of the Jewish church is to be considered, and the different state of the New Testament church from that of the Jewish. This is what our Reformed divines do, and this is what I have endeavored to do. The defense, page 80 and page one, or excuse me, page 180 and page 181. And is what I... Uh, and in the chapter 3, section 5 of this continuation. And if Mr. Lawson will grant that we ought not to maintain communion with a church where sinful terms of communion are imposed, and this is what he does own and must own if he is consistent with himself in his letter, I can prove at the same time, according as he lays the argument from the church of the Jews, that we ought to maintain ecclesiastical communion with a church even when sinful and unwarrantable terms of communion are imposed. And if Mr. Lawson should write for the real information of these whom he calls separatists, I wish that in his next he would give some distinct and satisfying answer to the above difficulty, yea, gross absurdity with which his argument is pressed. With respect to the churches mentioned under the New Testament where errors and corruptions had crept in, unless Mr. Lawson can prove that a course of defection was carried on by these several churches in their ecclesiastical capacity, and that they justified themselves in the same and refused to reform after admonitions, warnings, and repro reproofs given them, unless I say Mr. Lawson undertake to prove this, he speaks neither against the questions nor argument as I have stated them. Mr. Lawson, letter, page 19, regrets it as being a thing lamentable that some well-meaning people know nothing to purpose of the terms of church communion or of the just grounds of separation. He also observes the same thing in the appendix, page 24. I join with Mr. Lawson, and I think it is a lamentable thing that many who have the root of the matter in them, have so little knowledge of the true scripture, scriptural terms of church communion, and hence it is that there is so much of a blind conjunction as members of the same ecclesiastical body with judicatories who carry on a course of defection and backsliding from the Lord and refuse to be reclaimed after the ordinary means have been used for this effect. And I am afraid ministers are highly culpable and may be justly charged with cherishing and supporting such blindness and ignorance when they advance and maintain the above or the like lax principles concerning church communion, which I have mentioned. There is one thing I must notice, which Mr. Lawson confidently asserts, that is, quote, that between the years 1638 and 1649, these meetings that are called society meetings were discharged, unquote. I suppose he means by the assemblies of this church. These meetings that go under the name of society meetings are meetings of a few for joint prayer, and for conference with one another for their mutual instruction and edification. And I affirm that such meetings were never discharged in any period of this church. And though meetings of this kind, as well as any other ordinance of God, may be abused, yet to discharge such meetings would be to fly in the face of their warrant from Scripture pattern and example, as Malachi 3 verse 16. And I regard that Mr. Lawson throws a reproach upon this church, when he affirms so positively that such meetings were discharged during the period he mentions. As for the Assembly's Directory for Secret and Private Worship, Anon 1647, no such meetings as I have mentioned are discharged, but the meetings of persons of diverse families which had a tendency to the hindrance of the religious exercise of each family by itself, or which were to the prejudice of the public ministry, are justly disapproved. Mr. Lawson thinks fit to represent the present judicatories as a reforming church, particularly after the year 1733. He alleges matters were grown much better since that time, letter, page 13. But I have given several instances in the defense, chapter 2, section 6, wherein I show that, instead of being better, the present judicatories are, in the instances which I mentioned, worse since the foresaid year. I illustrate this with respect to some of these instances, chapter 3, section 4, of this continuation, Mr. Lawson complains of the seceders, 
that they have by a violent schism put all into confusion. Appendix 29, uh, appendix, appendix page 29, excuse me. That they have hindered and crushed in the very bud a very glorious begun work of reforma uh, reformation. Appendix page 26. These are very happy charges against the. Uh, these are very heavy charges, excuse me, against the seceding ministers. But in the meantime, they are most unjust. And it appears, if we consider what is advanced by Mr. Lawson in the page last quoted, where he says, I believe that the far greater part of the ministers and elders of this church are grieved for all the above corruptions and defections that are therein, and are much for a work of reformation and against defection. I wish sincerely it were so, but I want to see a ground for this faith which Mr. Lawson doth express. I am afraid for the testimony of most be taken, I'm afraid if the testimony of most be taken, it will amount to this, that there is no such thing as defections or corruptions in this church. Mr. Lawson believes that the greatest part of the ministers and elders of this church are of the disposition he mentions. I ask him, how could the secession of such a small number hinder, crush, or stop a glorious begun work of reformation? Nay, rather, if such a work of reformation was stopped, it is an evidence that the greatest part by far had not reformation work at heart. And though I doubt not, but some have been already, and are truly desirous of reformation, yet I am much afraid that the great things which Mr. Lawson boasts have been done have been rather a political feint amongst many than a steady resolution to go on in reformation work, and the proceedings of the two late pretended assemblies confirm me in this suspicion. Mr. Lawson lays several general charges against the seceders, such as that several of their pamphlets for separation are stuffed with the greatest falsehoods and calumnies that the father of lies or the corruption of men can invent, that the word of God is woefully misapplied, rested and abused, to serve the corrupt purposes and designs of men, etc., letter page 15. And he concludes his postscript with, con with affirming that the seceders have been left to make many wide and unwarrantable steps very inconsistent with our reform covenanted principles and the true design and interest of the glorious gospel. When the above general charges are laid without any particular condescension, they deserve no manner of notice or regard. They discover indeed the spirit of the letter writer, but they can neither convince nor inform these he calls separatists. Mr. Lawson thinks fit to express himself in a very warm and keen manner against the seceding ministers. He rails upon them as schismatics. He charges them with causing great disorders, with rendering evil for good. He alleges they are become the instruments of set fire, uh, to set fire further into God's sanctuary and to raise the flame when the anger of the Lord has divided us. Letter, page 13. I shall leave him to please himself in such railing. Only I must tell him that if he writes me again with so little reason and argument and in a style that favors of so much rancor, he must excuse me if I do not notice his letter, whether he thinks fit to publish them or not. The Reverend Mr. Lawson concludes his appendix with a few advices, as he calls them, to ministers, elders, and all church officers and others. Though I will not in a writing of this kind take upon me the character of an exhorter to ministers, yet I approve of the most of the advice that Mr. Lawson gives, and I wish particularly that his first were followed, namely, that ministers and elders would adhere to, maintain, and contend for all the parts of the doctrine, worship, discipline, and government of this church, and the whole of our valuable covenanted reformation, reformed principles. Cost us what it will, I am persuaded that if the present judicatories were showing an uniform disposition this way, the present secession would soon be a desirable period. I join with him likewise in the advice which he gives in the words of Solomon in the appendix, page 34. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. I reckon self-confidence and leaning to our own wisdom, the root and spring of many evils both in walk and practice, and particularly of such in union and communion with a backsliding and degenerate church, whereby the Redeemer is robbed of the glory of a particular full and free confession of him, in opposition to the injuries and indignities that may be done him in his person, truths, and members. And therefore, whereas Mr. Lawson entreats the repentance and reformation of all seceders, and that they may join in communion with this church in as honorable and good terms as can be obtained, in return to his advice, 
I judge it is the duty of all us seceders earnestly to pray that the spirit of repentance and reformation may be poured out upon the present judicatories and all such as are in conjunction with them, yea, upon all sorts of persons in our land, whether seceders or not. Until repentance and reformation take place, it is in vain to think of a desirable and lasting union. And may the same spirit of grace may be given to all the seceders, that they may abide singly, steadily, and humbly in the confession which they profess to make of the truths of our Lord Jesus in opposition to that current of lukewarmness, defection, and backsliding that runs with such force and violence in the present day and time. A letter from a member of the Associate Presbytery to a minister in the Presbytery of D., wherein the question concerning secession from the present judicatories is stated and examined, with a postscript containing some remarks on the Reverend Mr. Curry's essay on separation. Glasgow, printed by Joseph Galbraith and Company for Robert Aitken, bookseller, Paisley, in the year 1769. A letter from a member of the Associate Presbytery to a minister in the Presbytery of D. I should have given a return to yours in the 23rd of January last sooner, but I was hindered, partly through bodily indisposition and partly through a throng of other work upon my hands. You grant that what I wrote you concerning the conduct of the present judicatories since the year 1734 is a sad truth to wit that Reformation work hath not been at heart, at least with the most part. And likewise you own that indignities have been done in former years to the exalted Redeemer, both in his person and offices, by the Assembly's proceedings with Mr. Simpson and of late with Mr. Campbell, as also that the head of the Church has been dishonored by the late Act of Parliament and by ministers reading it as appointed, and that judicatories have not duly testified against it. I may add that... They have not in the least testified in their judicative capacity against the injury done thereby to the Redeemer's crown and kingdom. But yet, so far as you have hitherto understood the only rule to direct and guide in difficult cases, you write that when you consider some particular scripture instances that you mention, you are natively led to think that communion may be held with churches very corrupt and especially with such as have given no testimony at all against gross heretics and the heretics taught by them and consequently, as your missive imports, you do not see it to be your duty from the Lord's word to bear testimony against the sins, errors, and backslidings of the present times, and in the way of secession from the judicatories of this national church. Dr. B.R., I am heartily sorry that we should have different sentiments about the matter of testifying for injured truths of Christ in this day of perplexity and treading down in our valley of wisdom. I own that after the meeting of the assembly, 1734, I was in much perplexity about our continuing in a state of secession. It occasioned many thoughts of heart unto me to understand what was the duty in the present case. But as I had no hesitation about my duty when I did, together with my other three brethren, declare our secession from the present judicatories of this church, and our protestation entered before the commission of the General Assembly, November 1733, so when I have observed the conduct of the said judicatories since the year 1734, how, instead of returning to the Lord, they have gone further back, that I fear that word may be justly applied to them, Jeremiah 8, verses 4 and 5. Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit and refuse to return. I have been gradually cleared and more and more confirmed that it is our duty to continue in a state of secession from them, I should not have troubled you further upon this subject, but since you have been pleased to give me a hint at the scripture grounds and reasons which you judge to be of weight with you to determine you to continue in conjunction with the present judicatories, I will continue, uh, excuse me, I judge it my duty with all brotherly and Christian freedom and tenderness to lay more fully before you some considerations that have cleared my way and by which I have been confirmed in judging it my duty to concur with my brethren in testifying judicially in a way of secession from the present judicatories against former and present backslidings and defections that this whole church and land stand chargeable with. And if my views are wrong or if my reasons my reasonings are not just, I am willing to be set right from the only unerring rule and law and the testimony, and I desire, if my heart deceive me not, to lie open unto light from the Lord's word.